When it comes to international relations, we often talk about two countries, the United States, the reigning superpower, and the rising power of our century, China. Upon closer examination though, the 21st century may actually belong to another superpower or rising power, and that is India. Earlier this year, India became the most populous country on earth, and also the year saw India emerging as the fastest growing major economy on earth. But what makes India quite special is its unwillingness to side with any of the two superpowers while at the same time making the most out of all of its major bilateral and multilateral relationships. In fact, some would say that India has now invented or formalized and popularized a new way of approaching international relations, so-called multi-alignment. Under this strategy, India wants to maintain good relations with the West but also it wants to reach out to China in order to avoid unnecessary conflict. In the meantime, we saw following the conflict in Ukraine, India refused to side with the West against Russia, which happens to be a source of defense equipment and energy resources for India. But India is also becoming much more important to our region. In fact, bilateral relations between the Philippines and India have been on an upward trajectory over the past few years, especially after former President Rodrigo Duterte visited India and met Prime Minister Narendra Modi for the ASEAN-India Summit. One of the greatest signs of booming bilateral relations between the Philippines and India is the acquisition of the BrahMos supersonic missile systems. It is a milestone in bilateral defense relations and the hope is that the bilateral relations will move into a new era as India becomes a more and more influential actor, not only in South Asia, its own backyard, but across the Indo-Pacific region and beyond. Today, we have a special guest who's gonna help us to understand the rise of India in the 21st century, its multi-aligned and diversified foreign policy strategy, and of course, its bilateral relationship with the Philippines. Tonight, we're honored to be joined by Indian Ambassador to the Philippines, His Excellency Shambhu Santa Kumaran. Good evening, sir. Thank you for joining us. Good evening, Richard. Good to see you. <laughs> I hope I got your, your name right. Absolutely. Yeah. Spot on. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for joining us. Of course, um, we really felt we needed uh, you on our show uh, because India now is like the big thing. And we'll discuss why it's the big thing, literally in many ways. Um, I always felt that this discussion about the world as U.S. versus China was very reductive, very unhelpful, but also factually incorrect uh, in a sense that if you look at the picture, it's much more fluid and there are many rising powers. You can talk about Turkey and United Arab Emirates in the Middle East, for instance. You can even talk about some Eastern European countries. You can talk about Indonesia, right? There's so many rising powers to talk about. But among rising powers, there's one that really stands out. And of course, that's India, which now officially is the biggest country by population. Now, the thing is, as India becomes more and more prominent and it's getting the you know, much deserved attention, uh, people are wondering where does India stand on things? And nowadays it looks like the, the, the fat term is multi-alignment, right? I mean, we, we used to hear about non-alignment, the Neruvian uh, um, tradition in India. Can you tell us something about this, uh, Ambassador? Is India really embracing multi-alignment or a new version of non-alignment? Where does India stand on things? Well, I would say India is India aligned. <laughs> yes, yes. In that, I think uh, fundamentally, like all countries, uh, we would like to articulate our interests, seek complementarities right. with others. Uh, obviously, we would prefer uh, building deeper relationships with those uh, with whom we have shared values. And in many cases, obviously, you have uh, issues that require to be managed. Right. And in both in terms of promoting our interests and in terms of managing differences, it is sometimes inevitable that you have to work with groups of countries. Right. Uh, we don't work with formal treaty alliances, but we do have very deep and meaningful partnership it's, uh, with a range of countries. So in a sense, uh, you know, it's difficult to put a phrase to it, but I would say at the core of it, we are mm -hmm. India aligned, but we're also very strongly global as a country. We've traditionally right. been very global in our outlook. We understand that as a big country, 
uh, as as you said, as the largest, biggest country now by population. By population, yeah. we do have a responsibility uh, in terms of uh, you know addressing the global issues of the day, mm -hmm. and therefore we do we do engage very actively with a sense of global responsibility. It's not purely transactional in terms of right. India's own interests. We seek to build uh, larger platforms. The Prime Minister, for instance, has come up with something like the International Solar Alliance. Right. We try to also uh, increasingly reach into uh, Indian uh, culture and civilization. Right. So for instance, the International Day of Yoga uh, on 21st June is something that was started in 2014, but it's become right. an, you know, like a global celebration, which has its roots in Indian culture, but is really something that has become quite global. global yeah. So I think uh, broadly, if you look at Indian foreign policy, it encapsulates a very strong articulation of our interests, right. a sense of responsibility, and a projection of our unique uh, civilizational personality. Right. Um, Ambassador, we'll go to a little bit of the controversial issues shortly, but I just, I'm just curious, like, um, do you feel anxious that there's suddenly all of these expectations of India? I mean, I, I mean, a lot of us, you know, in the punditry world, we have been talking about India, potential of India, but now it seems like that potential is finally being actualized. I mean, the, the fastest growing major economy in 2023 and given the demographic trend lines in India, given the whole China plus Apple coming in, the expectation is for the next five to 10 years, India will be a big thing and potentially the third largest economy sooner than Absolutely. later, right? Uh, are you feeling nervous about it? I mean, comparing like when you were younger, right? Before you became a diplomat, did you expect that India will become the force it is today as, as early as 2023? Somehow I think in India, we always mm. had a sense that uh, we uh, we had to play a larger role. Right. We felt that uh, India uh, was emerging. Uh, obviously, we had a difficult experience with colonialism. Uh, geographically, uh, we had uh, to confront new realities uh, as we became independent. Right. There were geopolitical constraints that uh, flew uh, that were uh, coming out of the Cold War. Right. Uh, economically, some of the policies that we followed did not bear the results. Uh, they were the more state command driven economy. It was, the results were quite mixed at best. Mm. But I, I would say since 1990, particularly after the end of the Cold War and the opening up of the Indian economy and the sort of growing uh, confidence right. of Indians in general, you know, they've uh, gone uh, abroad, right. worked hard. India, uh, within India itself, the economy has picked up a lot of momentum, our market size has grown, we've got large companies, we've done well in some technology sectors, right. especially IT, pharmaceuticals. So gradually, the sense of confidence in the country mm -hmm. has grown. Uh, we have uh, st strong, decisive leadership. So I think generally the sense currently in India is definitely not one of anxiety, right. but uh, I would say uh, one of anticipation, but realistic anticipation in that mm -hmm. we do recognize that uh, changing structures, getting us a seat at the, at the right table right. is going to take time, but mm -hmm. uh, we are confident that uh, it will happen. Is there a sense of vindication also, like the sense that you're looking past us for quite some time and you can no longer do that? It's just the sheer size and influence of India nowadays? Is, it's just unmistakable, right? Undeniable. Uh, partly, perhaps, but I think we, have want, we want to look at it uh, from a more forward looking perspective. Right. Rather than. You I know, don't think it's about settling scores, right. etc. We recognize mm -hmm. that uh, the world is what it is. There's, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's more. Uh, we have a realistic appreciation that you count when you count. And uh, today, increasingly, we count. And therefore, I think uh, we would like to be part of the conversation. We are increasingly uh, part of several conversations of consequence. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the absence of the current multilateral structures, particularly the UN, to reflect the realities of the contemporary. I mean, India is not part of the permanent. U it, it's still a mystery. I mean, I don't know. Maybe you want to uh, correct the, us. The, I mean, there's still a debate about what are the exact circumstances behind India not being there. Some are saying that. Uh, you know, the late Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru was, you know, in, I don't know, 
to make sure things don't get uh, because China of PRC China was not part of the UN uh, until the 70s, right? The idea was that like, maybe they, they, they want to be part of it because they didn't want to legitimize the you know the weird setup of a UN Permanent Security Council. But for a lot of us, I mean, regardless of what are the historical factors, the idea that the second largest and now the first largest country by population is not part of the UN Permanent Security Council it's just scandalously you know outlying. I mean, it, it's just you cannot deny it. I, I, so when I say vindication, I don't mean in terms of anger and resentment, but in terms of like this just peculiar situation of India not getting proportionate uh, recognition that perhaps a lot of us from the post-colonial world felt he deserved. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think to, from that perspective, definitely we feel that our uh, efforts to grow our economy and we have uh, worked a very uh, strong democratic system and I, I do sense that in the, in the medium to longer term, democracies will thrive mm -hmm. in this knowledge-driven economy that is currently expressing itself in global terms. Uh, autocracies uh, may have their moments. Mm -hmm. I think in the longer term, we believe that democratic societies with their openness uh, ha are more resilient mm -hmm. to shocks and decision-making is more socially aware ecologically aware and also I think globally uh, responsible. Slower but steadier in, in that sense. And not necessarily slow as you as you rightly mm. noted we are now growing quite fast. I, I, I don't believe that democracies necessarily need to grow slower. Mm -hmm. I, I think India could be the counterfactual in that case. Or the Philippines for that matter. And We're going Philippines at 68 percent. is an excellent yeah. example and it's yeah. uh, the, the fact is that Obviously, certain types of decisions are faster right. in some systems, but I, I sense that if you look at the past uh, two to three decades, mm. uh, while you know some countries have grown very fast, uh, the growth in countries like India has not been insignificant, or the Philippines for that matter, right, for the past right. decade. You, you know, the pandemic was a blip and, and every right. economy felt the brunt of that. But the, the sort of secular trend in democracies is towards increasing rates of growth. So mm -hmm. I don't buy that argument that democracies will grow s slower. Mm -hmm. I, I do, however, believe that democracies will be steadier. Steadier, right. Steadier, but not necessarily, not necessarily slower. slower. That's a good slogan, right? Yeah, I'm very glad that you uh, clarified that because I think there has been kind of an element of uh, democracy skepticism or fatigue uh, across many parts of the world, including in India not, not, not long ago, including the Philippines. And the idea is that you need strong, decisive leader, leaders with strong executive background, including Narendra Modi from the Gujarat model. Uh, in the Philippines, of course, we had President Duterte not long ago from the Davao model. And it looks like it's the same thing also in countries like Turkey, it's kind of a decisive leader. But at the same time, as you know, there are also critics, right? They're saying that maybe India is not necessarily moving in the right direction in terms of democratization. Uh, what do you say about that as far as the critics are concerned? I think they don't understand India I could at all. see in your eyes, like, you know, he gave me the eye roll. You know, it's like, yeah. I, I think that India's democracy has become deeper. And it's, it's, uh, it's India's uh, democracy is uh, arguably the oldest. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we draw democratic inspiration uh, deeply in our civilizational ethos. Ancient times, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's not, uh, as some in the West like to portray it, it's not something that dropped down on us, uh, was gifted to us by some Western commentators or, you know. Colonialism. Yeah. It's something that we believe deeply in because if you look at the tenets in India, where the rulers had to, you know, work towards the welfare of the mm -hmm. larger section of the people. Uh, this thing that Sarva Jana Hitayas, you know, which right. basically meant that you had to, the ruler, that was a test for the ruler. Right. And an optimal ruler was the person who took care of the most uh, deprived person in his kingdom. Mm -hmm. And going into the panchayat system and the village councils where decisions right. were made somewhat, cons you know, in a consultative manner. Obviously, if you look at it from, you know, the, the perspective of contemporary democracy, you might find, uh, you know, some things are, are right. lacking. But, the but so is the Athenian system, exactly, nothing like exactly. real democracy as we so understand it. By, right? the, yeah. by the standards of that time, yeah. and the, the essential point is that the kernel is about respecting other points of view, right. about uh, the ability to debate things, arrive at consensus. Right. And uh, if you look at it, uh, also 
uh, when you say respect, it's not just respect for other people, but even broadly respect for all of nature. Right. So it's really, if you look at Jain uh, teachings, which is right. a uh, all major, living things are all living sacred. Sin, yeah. yeah. So yeah. You, you know, so, so that sense of value for life right. is, I think, essentially what democracy is all about. Mm. Meaning, you know, you need to respect other perspectives. I see. And value uh, life, uh, and take decisions that will benefit the majority. So these are classical Indian thoughts. Right. So Indian democracy is. Uh, obviously being strengthened by the fact that we have a strong electoral system and right. a lot of institutions, etc. And uh, there are obviously uh, points where there could be debate, but mm -hmm. it, the fact is that it is through debate that you right. develop. And uh, currently I would say Indian democracy is in excellent health. Mm -hmm. It is, uh, I would say, uh, the deeply connected uh, with the with the will of the people that uh, the freedom of expression in fact is is such that many observers from outside struggle to understand the the are you saying that there's like a bias or something like that that that's there, there's no appreciation of the realities on the ground i mean some indexes put uh, you know mm. uh, press freedom in india below that of afghanistan so i mean what sort of credibility can mm -hmm. you have when you make such indexes? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there has to be a, a, a coherence, certain a certain uh, deeper sense of analysis, mm -hmm. qualitative, qualitative. Mm -hmm. Ambassador, um, I mean, I, I'm glad that you mentioned the ancient roots of democracy and consensus-based decision making because a lot of us, I mean, including Manila, I mean, Nila, right? It has Sanskrit roots, right? And and here in ASEAN region, we'll talk more about ASEAN later on, but in ASEAN region, we also have a very consultative consensus-based yeah. decision making. And we know that yeah. before the advent of Islam and Christianity, it was the Indic uh, Indian culture that had huge influence Absolutely. in our part of the world. And, and uh, so I, I relate very much when you talk about the village level, we have our barangay systems. So as much as we have our own unique, uh, let's say, Austronesian values, I think there's a lot that we got from the ancient uh, Indian civilization, and, right? I, including I, here in the Philippines. Absolutely. Yeah, but I, I don't think it's as much appreciated because people see perhaps more the Indian influence in, I don't know, Champa, in Vietnam or in Indochina. But I always remind people, Manila, the very word Manila, there's a Sanskrit root to that, right? A lot yeah. of uh, words in the Filipino language. Guru. Guru, yeah, for exactly, example, yeah. uh, Devata. Exactly. So many words. I mean, yeah. and particularly words that have to do with spirituality and culture. Right. They have Indian roots. And obviously, it's documented that uh, many artifacts that are found in, in the Philippines, right. they were, of course, connected to the Southeast Asian empires. But the Agusan Tara, for example, right, or right, the, right. the Laguna Copper Plate, which are the right. oldest artifacts in Philippine history. Right. The Laguna Copper Plate is actually written in a script that is connected to Devanagari script of India. So Interesting, yeah. uh, there was this regular flow of trade and ideas and spirituality between India and Southeast Asia. And it was Asia. a dialogue. It was not a one-way street. It was street definitely import. a dialogue. Yeah, and yeah. I think it was, India's strength has always been the power of its ideas. Right. And it was not really uh, the power of conquest right. and military domination. Right. I, mean, I mean, I was just checking some of the Silk Road's books, and it was talking about how the, the maritime routes from Java, you know, Srivijaya to southern India, then moving to Persia and Absolutely. beyond. Absolutely. How that was extremely well connected, and the whole monsoon system that was there Correct. prior to the arrival of the West. Because I mean, I think this is where we are becoming post-colonial. <laughs> but I mean, the reality is that everyone talks about Asia as if we were all just isolated folks until this Europeans came and connected us and globalization was made. But that's not true. I mean, there was already all of this I think when the Europeans came, they disconnected us. <laughs> and I, I, yeah. I mean, it, it is what history is. And obviously, there's, it is, uh, you know, not to be something that one is looking back constantly. But the fact is that mm -hmm. these connections were actually disrupted. And colonialism particularly disrupted uh, South Asia in very profound mm. ways. You know, India lost its connectivity to Persia and Central Asia. Yeah. Uh, and of course, various other developments in our neighborhood uh, created a uh, somewhat complex environment, as I was saying earlier, right, right. for India to develop. And connections to Southeast Asia were also uh, seriously disrupted. And I think it's post-1990. Uh, when uh, we started actively engaging under our Look East, which is now the right, Act East policy. Right. Uh, ASEAN right now is amongst our largest trading partners. It's yeah. uh, 
I think if you look at ASEAN as a block, it's potentially as much uh, of trade as with the European Union. So it's a very, right. very profound transformation in the past three decades. And uh, in doing uh, so, in connecting economically, we have also begun to rediscover right. uh, historical connections and uh, celebrate them in, in many ways. Uh, I mean, if you look at uh, Thailand, for example, the, the Buddhist connection is very, very profound. Right, very, very strong. Even southern Vietnam, I was just there uh, in Da Nang the other month, and I was looking at the temples from the, and wow, I mean, the influence of India is very strong. I mean, usually people talk about Vietnam, the Chinese influence, but they tend to forget southern Vietnam was a huge, I mean, there are even temples, yes, right, in, in, yes, in, in central right. Uh, Vietnam. Uh, Cambodia also. Exactly, definitely. Um, can we park the ASEAN shortly? Because I still want to push you on some of the global issues, as you can imagine. So um, the other year, uh, I, I don't think uh, Secretary Jashankar was this year in the Munich Security Conference, but he was there and he was, there was a quadrilateral um, panel. And I asked him about this accusation that people looking at Quad as some sort of Asian NATO or, or NATO with Asian characteristics. I mean, that's not my idea. I'm very critical of that, uh, that, that characterization. And I... I noticed uh, Secretary Jashankar was very clear that this is not four treaty allies together, maybe those three, but India has its own way. And, and, and that line of argument became much more pronounced mm -hmm. not long after, a few mm -hmm. weeks after, after the war in, in Ukraine commenced. Yeah. Yeah. Now, obviously, one of the reasons why many, there's a lot of debate about taking India as it is, is, is precisely because of India's some would say unique positioning mm -hmm. on the conflict on Ukraine, which mm -hmm. is there's a post-colonial solidarity, but at the same time, there's also the element of your strong relationship with Russia, while at the same time, of course, you are maintaining very strong uh, strategic relationship uh, with the West. Before we talk the Russia part, can you tell us what is the Quad all about? Because I think especially in, in the Philippines, there's a lot of misunderstanding about the Quad. It's like, oh, four big boys coming together to gang up on China. And my sense is when talking to our Indian friends, they keep on saying, no, this is not about China per se. This is about finding common ground and working where we can. What is the Quad? Where, where does India well, stand uh, in the Quad? Let me answer it in a few, a few ways. One is, uh, mm -hmm. let's look at how Quad started. Right. Essentially, this co combination of uh, India, the United States, Japan, and Australia started as a response to the tsunami of 2005. Sure. So, you know, it was essentially about how do we combine to provide the, uh, shall we say, humanitarian, humanitarian assistance, assistance disaster, disaster relief operations, yeah. And in doing so, we recognize that there's a considerable value in right. working together. Uh, obviously, then for a brief period of time, it did not really get sustained. But subsequently, uh, as we began to build our relationship with the United States and with Japan and with Australia, I think there also came a point where we felt that this sort of a combination of four democracies uh, really sense. has yeah. uh, a lot of, as I was mentioning earlier, we have shared values and complementary interests. And I don't sense in, in India's thinking about Quad that this is purely a militaristic solution mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to a set of issues. Having said that, obviously there are a broad range of issues that are now on the table. Right. You know, some of which have security uh, dimensions and ramifications and obviously the quad countries are interested maritime security for example right but also things like critical technologies right. uh, you know critical minerals mm -hmm. uh, climate vaccination. change vaccination vaccination yeah. very big quad absolutely on that. right yeah, yeah. so the quad initiative on vaccines is a good example so what what we are trying to do is to mm -hmm. build habits of cooperation build habits of working together right uh, and as countries with some capacity mm -hmm. uh, to 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 sort of contribute towards the uh, situation in this region in the broader Indo-Pacific, uh, we have uh, engaged with the Pacific Island countries. We are engaging right. with ASEAN, and we continue to sort of try to work in a collaborative manner. Where, for example, with ASEAN, we recognize that right. ASEAN is central to ASEAN as a, as a unit is central to what happens in this particular part of the Indo-Pacific. Right. So we definitely would like to have as Quad partnerships that work with the priorities mm -hmm. of countries in the region. So it's not as though Quad has an agenda that it seeks mm -hmm. to superimpose 
Right. But definitely in terms of delivering uh, the public goods that are necessary yeah. in many areas. Tangible goods, yeah. And uh, also to a certain extent, uh, responsible financing. Mm -hmm. Sustainably, you know, able to finance projects, etc. Right. Because debt has become a big issue. Right. So there are many dimensions, financial, economic, climate change, technology, trusted partners uh, for Quad. So uh, defense engagement is an important part of that process. And there's nothing unusual about it. As four countries with shared interests, we will have a lot of defense cooperation. But it's also. not the end all be all. Yeah, yeah. it's not the, st the beginning and the end of Quad. Right, it's, it's a right. lot broader. And I, I do sense that it's becoming more and more uh, accepted mm -hmm. as a as a formation mm -hmm. and uh, many countries and groups want to cooperate with Quad, and I think this trend will increase. Yeah, I mean, we can talk about China shortly, yeah. but you have very robust relationship with Russia. You have investment in Chopahar in southern Iran. Uh, at the same time, you have very strong relationship with the U.S. as the recent visit by Prime Minister Modi uh, to Washington, D.C. in the White House. Uh, very much exemplifies. Um, I, I just want our audience to understand where is India coming from, that this is not just about making the most out of relationship, but there's a deep history to relations with Russia, with Iran, many of these other countries who are not uh, you know, on best terms, to put it mildly, with, with the West. But before those, those countries, can we talk about China? Like, to what degree is China shaping India's strategy, including the Quad, uh, for those who may just see Quad as a way of ganging up on China. What is a China-India dynamics? It, it, this is important because you're the two biggest powers in this region, yeah? I, I think it's safe to say that the mm -hmm. India-China relationship is going through uh, a very difficult phase, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, especially after the uh, incidents along the, uh, along the boundary areas in the summer of 2020, mm -hmm. which uh, were in violation of written agreements and very clear protocols and practices that had been followed for nearly four decades to maintain peace and tranquility in those areas. So the line of actual control area. Yeah, yeah. So therefore, I, I think that there, there, there has been a, a disruption in the, in the, in the uh, uh, relationship between the two countries. Uh, we do continue to try and have a conversation mm -hmm. Uh, around how to resolve those issues to uh, the satisfaction of uh, our, from our perspective. Uh, it, is, it is an ongoing process. Mm -hmm. And what has happened is that this whole process and the developments that led, led to this conversation have cast a shadow mm. on what we had originally envisaged would be a process right. of, of uh, managing the boundary question in a, in a, in a quiet uh, manner having the uh, you know discussions around it, but at the same time allowing other aspects of our relationship to grow, and also cooperating in many multilateral formats. You know whether it's in BRICS or in climate change, the concept of basic right. in WTO, where, where oftentimes we had uh, you know similar interests as emerging mm -hmm. economies. So definitely there were there was a sense that we, there was uh, and uh, remains the possibility that we could continue to engage together. Mm -hmm. But what has happened has cast right. a shadow on this. The border disputes and all of that. Yeah. The, it, because it was uh, essentially a violation, as I said, of the written agreements mm -hmm. and what had been very clearly established over years of practice. So uh, you can't go back mm -hmm. uh, to pretend as though that didn't happen. Right. Uh, we have to uh, understand why it happened. We have to, of course, make sure that uh, that sort of thing does not happen. That mm -hmm. degree of trust needs to come back in that relationship. Yeah. I mean, w we had fatal, uh, including hand-to-hand -hand combats in the Himalayas uh, not long ago. And I remember very well, I mean, I covered these things uh, as a journalist. It was, uh, you know, during one of uh, the visit of President Xi Jinping to, to uh, India, when Prime Minister Modi was really on a personal diplomacy level. That's where, like, shortly after the incident in the Himalayas happened. So people are wondering what's really going on here. Um, but what actually also worries a lot of people is, I think now there are no Indian journalists sanctioned in China and something like vice versa or something like that, like the people to people exchanges is nowhere close to where it used to be. And well, even I mean, TikTok is being banned in India. Like what's going on we, here? We've yeah. obviously uh, had to take certain measures. Decisive measures. Mm -hmm. and we've had to take certain measures to ensure that uh, some of the uh, 
difficulties that mm -hmm. you know we were encountering could be managed effectively. Uh, that process is, as I said, ongoing because right. uh, what has happened uh, has not been resolved to our satisfaction. And because a certain series of steps were taken, uh, it reflects that uh, we have the intent Correct. to make sure that the relationship is on terms mm -hmm. that are not set unilaterally by one side, that uh, there can be no coercion in terms of trying to you know, set the parameters mm -hmm. of what is uh, to be done or not done. So we do, we do uh, feel that there has to be uh, a, a appreciation of the sensitivities mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we red lines for that matter yeah uh, or even red lines yeah the, the 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 sense that we have is that big countries mm -hmm. uh, have to be behaving in very responsible ways mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and if you see some of the actions uh, in not just along the Himalayas but even other theatres like what the Philippines has been complaining about. Essentially that is not very conducive to stability and uh, stability is important for prosperity so therefore not for prosperity either. So uh, larger countries, very powerful countries must introspect about their actions, how that impacts other countries and if there are issues mm -hmm. they have to be resolved without coercion mm -hmm. and in a, in a more uh, uh, based on dialogue and consultations. So that's, we, that's without forcibly changing the facts on the ground because I think that's the tendency some people see is that they're open to dialogue and then they're changing the facts on the ground while having a dialogue. I mean we have the situation with the code of conduct in the South China Sea situation. So uh, the reason I, I raise this is because I want people to un also understand that India has, has its own territorial headache uh, as far as its relations with the biggest economy in this region is concerned. Now, can we talk a little bit about, uh, I, I, of course, I know your colleagues, their colleagues of yours who have to, but just a big picture for our audience to understand. What is the history of Russia-India relations? And, 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 and the reason I'm asking this is because my sense is uh, the Russia-India relationship is not something that is, you know, ephemeral. I mean, my sense is the East-West corridor, North-South North -South corridor, especially it's Iran and Russia have a stronger relationship. All of them are going to get connected, right? I mean, everyone talks about Belt and Road Initiative, but... India is playing its own global game and it has good relationship with multiple sides simultaneously. Um, I think many people are not familiar about the legacy of Cold War when you know India and the West were not necessarily on the best of terms and, and the fact that Soviet Union back in the day and Russia provided a lot of important weapon systems to you vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan which got very good, uh, you know, two good, a very good relationship with China. Can you just explain a little bit for our audience what is this bond between Russia and, and, and India that may explain the current state of affairs yeah, in some ways? Yeah. Well, we've always regarded Russia as a very uh, important partner. Mm -hmm. We've, of course, had a lot of historical relationships right. with Russia. Uh, we, during the Cold War, as you rightly said, we had very close cooperation with Russia, not just in terms of defense, right. but uh, Russia uh, helped in many ways in terms of science education, and science yeah. and technology, yeah. building steel plants, etc. So it was uh, really quite a wide range of uh, engagement that we had. We had uh, also uh, strong political support from Russia on multiple occasions, uh, critically, for example, when in 1971, when the when Bangladesh was was created, right, uh, and in East Pakistan back then, uh, right? back yeah, then yeah, East yeah, Pakistan, yeah, yeah. which then subsequently became Bangladesh, uh, but broadly there has been this sense of trust in that relationship because on multiple occasions we have uh, relied mm -hmm. on Russian support, uh, and uh, subsequent to. Uh, the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union, of course, uh, Russia has been working closely with us. We continue to have a strong uh, defense engagement with them in, in many areas. And I think today we, we are also looking at it as a major partner, let's say, on energy security. Right. Uh, we are a large uh, Biggest energy. importer of Russian oil earlier this year. We, right? are, yeah. we, uh, we are a large energy mm. import dependent mm. country. And uh, energy prices have a direct impact 
on uh, prices uh, for, of general goods because freight and other things come into play. And uh, energy prices also impact fertilizer prices. So food security becomes yeah. an issue. So for us, uh, looking for affordable energy is not uh, a, a luxury. A luxury, yeah. It's yeah. a necessity. So obviously, Russia continues to be an important uh, partner for us in that sense. It's of, of late that the, the numbers have been increasing. But we do have, have had uh, cooperation with them in uh, other areas. Uh, science and technology space right. uh, is one area we have cooperation atomic energy with them so it's a broad ranging relationship and uh, we do sense that that relationship is something that mm -hmm. is important for uh, larger in the larger asian context because uh, in, you know given the current trends where some certain uh, formations are being created, right. I think lines, it's yeah. important for India to be, as you said, building this relationship, uh, continuing to have this relationship with Russia, exploring partnerships with countries like Iran, for example. Right. Just a question on this. I mean, China is also presenting itself as a potential peace broker because uh, it has a good relationship with both Ukraine, which mm -hmm. used to mm -hmm. count China as its top trading partner, and also with Russia, obviously. Um, but India also has very good relationship with Russia, and, and, and Prime Minister Modi seems to be have a rapport with President Putin. We sh saw during the Shanghai Cooperation Organization that Prime Minister Modi even expressed some general thoughts about that this era is not the era of wars. Yes, that's right. And I think that really got attention for a lot of people. You're together within the BRICS organization. You're going to decide on whether BRICS will be expanded to bring in Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and those kinds of countries. Sure. Um, do you think that India at some point can play also peace breaking, uh, peace broker role? Because I think uh, President Zelensky has, on multiple occasions, including with your media in India, has reached out and asked for you. I'm asking this because this is also the era of India as a global force, not only as a regional power. Yeah. Well, it's it's a bit of a uh, partly a hypothetical question, yeah, but let me so answer far, it. Yeah. Let me answer it by saying that we would definitely like to see peace mm -hmm. because. Uh, obviously across the global south right this conflict has had very negative consequences so we'd li really like to see peace and the uh, absence of military conflict is something that we deeply uh, seek having said that we we also recognize that to make peace you have to have parties who are willing to right make peace and obviously if india is called upon to play any role in that regard i'm sure you'll not find us wanting right but at this stage, it's somewhat hypothetical to talk about mm -hmm. it because, as I said, both all the parties involved need to want to uh, have that desire to to build a peace. Right, uh, guys. This part lang, no, just in case lang, ano, uh, my development by August. We'll just have to edit it, just in case if there's a. Yeah, I just had at the back of my mind. Who knows? By August, there could be a development. Okay, now I'll go to Asia. Okay. Ambassador, obviously, you know, we talked big picture issues, but now let's go to. What's really your job here, right? which is <laughs> Philippines and Asia? I'm sorry, I didn't want to put you on the. I, I, I just wanted our audience to have a general understanding of what India says. I'm sure you have very able colleagues in, in Beijing and Moscow and Tehran to explain things. So please, uh, I hope I didn't push you too much on that. Now let's talk about ASEAN. Now this is really, really your primary uh, designate. I mean, really area of focus. Where is this East policy, Lukis policy? Where is it going? What is the evolution we're looking at? Um, I remember a few years ago, folks from the Indian Navy, I think some of them used the word even West Philippine Sea. I mean, maybe you want to correct me, but, but so like that was interesting. I think that suddenly that got attention of a lot of us in the Philippines. Everyone was like, wow, because we know India has had strong relations, you know, including with Myanmar, quite controversially, but also with Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, but not as much with fellow democracies, all democracies in Asia, like, like the Philippines. But that has been changing very fast. Just over the past half a decade, I think since the India ASEAN inaugural summit that coincided with, I think, your Independence Day, which is you know, close to our interview era. Um, what explains this? Is it because inevitably India, as it becomes a global force, is going to care more about beyond Indian Ocean? Is it because there's something special about ASEAN? There's a, what are the push and pull factors here that are bringing two sides together like never before? I think it's, uh, it's a variety of factors, yeah. as you rightly attributed it. Uh, one, of course, uh, as the Cold War ended, right. and uh, we were looking towards building a range of new partnerships. Mm -hmm. 
ASEAN suggested itself. Uh, there was uh, extremely good growth potential, growth rates. Right. We, as you, as we discussed, we had civilizational connections. We had very deep friendships with many of the ASEAN countries. So obviously, uh, look east. Uh, uh, that started in the early nineties, mm -hmm. and then uh, progressively the economic relationship flowered. Our dialogue uh, with ASEAN got institutionalized, and in two thousand and fourteen fifteen. The look east was upgraded to an act east policy, which right. essentially primary What's the, difference the primary from, yeah, focus yeah. was that we moved from a purely economic orientation mm. to uh, talk about things like maritime security, so multi-dimensional, and mm. to uh, to more to a more uh, shall we say uh, broader and deeper partnership with ASEAN. We just had, for example. Uh, uh, the India ASEAN maritime exercise, which was right, earlier this year, yeah, we've had uh, we've had a lot of conversations uh, on uh, defense with multiple ASEAN countries. Right. Uh, the Philippines, for example, is one of our uh, recent uh, partners in in terms of defense equipment. Yeah, I mean, we we got the BrahMos missile system the other year. I mean, it, do you think that's like the beginning of a whole new chapter? Absolutely, yeah. I think it's a mm. it's a it's a milestone moment for uh, both our countries. Uh, it shows a degree of trust in India from the Philippines. It shows our uh, intent uh, to to contribute in a meaningful manner to Philippines' uh, national security, uh, and the Act East policy therefore goes into a broader set of partnerships and. ASEAN itself is looking for, so to answer your question, right. not just India looking, but I think right. ASEAN is also way, from that yeah. side looking at uh, a stronger partnership with India as India grows. So it's really uh, a sense that this is an old partnership which has new energy and a new vision and we are working together to make that happen. And uh, currently the trends are all very, very positive, mm -hmm. all the trend lines, uh, as I was mentioning, ASEAN-India trade is uh, is uh, you know north of 100 billion dollars right north, yeah. it's close to 130 billion 30, yeah, yeah 130 well i mean not as close as i mean china is still i think at more than 600 billion but still the potential is huge right as the two side pay more attention to each other and just to wrap up i mean we can talk a lot about this but recently also at fintech yes. uh, agreements between the two sides and mou um back in the uh, time when President Duterte uh, visited uh, Delhi, there was discussion about pharmaceutical because you're, you're a superpower when it comes to, you know, pharmaceutical sure. industry, sure. I mean, including vaccination production. Uh, what has been the trend line in that and what are we looking at down the road? Because both of us have very robust BPO well, The Philippines industry. is emerging as one of the stars of India's uh, Act East policy. Right. Uh, I, I would sense that the relationship had underperformed for many years. Right, right. But the past few years have witnessed a a steady and now fairly substantial uh, forward movement. This year, we've crossed uh, $3 billion of bilateral trade for the first time. And the important thing is that the Philippines' uh, exports to India grew faster than India's exports right. to the Philippines. So it's it's mutually, uh, both, both sides yeah. are benefiting from this trade. We are looking towards uh, working on a preferential trade agreement that will increase mm. our trade. Uh, earlier this year, we signed an agreement to initiate Indian development cooperation projects here, so-called QIPs. Right. Um, as you mentioned, we've signed an agreement on financial technology where India is doing extraordinarily well. And some of those uh, processes, uh, practices could be- Unicorns of India maybe. Could yeah, be of yeah. use to the Philippines. Some of our companies already here. We do, of course, uh, do a lot of work together on the BPO side. Uh, right. Many of the Indian BPO companies are here. And it's a less known fact that Nearly 200,000 Filipinos are working in Indian BPOs that are right. Here. So connected to Bangalore and that whole absolutely. World. Yeah, so yeah. it's a it's a very uh, shall we say integrated business at one level. And then pharmaceuticals and healthcare, as you mentioned, right? Exactly. Yeah. And also, I feel areas like agriculture could be potentially sure. of, of great interest. So really, if you look at the India-Philippines relationship, we spoke also about defense, and uh, we will be opening a new defense wing in our embassy shortly to kind of try and institutionalize this engagement. We want to do more training, we want to do more exercises with the Philippines military. Uh, and I, I, I do get the sense that right. it's all coming together quite nicely. Uh, it's a, some sort of a golden era is perhaps within sight or at least bronze. <laughs> I, de definitely, I think definitely. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> definitely one of the, uh, if not the best, uh, right. one of the best phases 
for the India-Philippines relationship and the trend lines, as I said, across the board, very, very positive. positive. Yeah, yeah. And uh, political leadership, uh, remarkably committed to this relationship, whether it's President Marcos or Prime Minister Modi, definitely the direction, or indeed, as you mentioned, Dr. Jayashankar, who was here. Right. Uh, the direction is to push this partnership mm. in a very meaningful way and uh, uh, the, uh, from the embassy, we've done multiple events. We've yeah, focused, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, for we focused on connecting mm. businesses on both right. sides. We've also done innovative cultural collaborations. Right. Uh, the Philippines Madrigal Singers rendering Indian folk songs. Right. We translated uh, with Ateneo de Manila, created Tagalog podcasts of uh, right. Buddhist Jataka tales for oh, Filipino wow. children. So we've done innovative cultural uh, exchanges also. We've signed a new air services agreement. It's going to be, it's been ratified. Right. So we will hopefully have new direct mm. flights. The Philippines government has announced that it will offer e-visas for Indian right. tourists. So, you know, you add all of this together. And, and not to mention like Tata Group and some of your manufacturing powerhouses among the most innovative on earth, Fortune 5 and companies. I see a lot of Tata cars recently. I mean, not as many as perhaps we should see, but I mean, I think that's another thing that definitely we should be ready for, automobiles right? Indian is, cars. is an area, definitely automobiles is an area. And yeah. we've been talking to the Philippines government also very actively on a large Indian uh, soft loan funded infrastructure project. Right. Uh, this could potentially be in the railway sector. So we were having a very active conversation around that. That could be potentially very transformative. As you know, one of the Indian companies the is Cebu operating airport. the airport. Yeah, the so Cebu airport, yeah. This would mean that we're coming in in a meaningful way in infrastructure. Mactan. Yeah, Mactan. That, that's, I think that's the most beautiful airport the Philippines has. And I think people have to remember Indian companies were involved. But when I first heard it, I was like, wow, that's very interesting. And I saw your airports in Mumbai. They're beautiful. And I Thank think you. the infrastructure build up over the past decade in India has been really remarkable. So I think... Yeah. We are really on a positive trajectory. On that note, thank you very much, Ambassador, thank for you, joining thank us. You. I'm Have looking forward to more conversation and hopefully more uh, groundbreaking uh, developments. And uh, you know, hopefully our leaders will pay more visits to each other's capital yeah, in the look forward foreseeable to future. Perfect. Namaste. Thank Namaste. you very much, thank uh, you. Ambassador. Thank you. Catch us again next week here on One News. You can also check out the long conversation on Spotify, YouTube, and Google Podcasts. I'm Richard Haydarian, and that is The View from Manila. We're one news, all sides, all the time.